Hello. I know, right? I didn't get that right. It was terrible. Tom Bennett, I'm an experienced strategist here at Connected DX, as Dave mentioned. And I'd like to talk to you about a, a journey of mine. Journey is a word that's come up a lot today. Andrew talked about journey and about this scale. We talked about that last night. I want to zoom out a, a long way and talk about the big look at, at what journey and story can do and how there's a growing um, requirement or uh, a focus on empathy and, and intimacy in the research process. And so I, I, had, I had an experience that took me someplace, and uh, I hope to share it with you. So there's, to those that know me, there's probably no surprise, but I was removed from kindergarten several times for having hugged other children that were crying. So I, I kind of have a history here of, of uh, driving toward intimacy with, with colleagues and friends. And so it's a story my mother just never ceases to tell over and over. <laughs> so, um, but you know, in the, in the business that we're working with, you know, I've been at this for a long time, and it, it used to be about uh, connecting with people. It used to be about social. It used to be about motivating, meeting, motivating people and creating change. And, and now we're starting to talk, really, you know, all the time about experience. And experience is a different animal now. Uh, experience is something that not only motiv might motivate the head, but it motivates the hands and especially motivates the heart because we want to understand people. We need to get closer to their internal thought patterns and, and different ways to connect with people. The other thing about experience is that it's an enormously um, unique and personal experience. Someone's, someone's experience is their own. And so to understand it, to design for it, to be able to motivate people within it means that we need to slow down and we need to kind of help people, help customers express their unique experiences that are motivational to them. So I'm older than some, but you know, I grew up in a world where rationality was the highest form of thought. You know, Mr. Spock was, if anything, cold and calculating and clear, and he was the smartest person on the bridge and often saved the day, okay? And so the highest form of kind of intellectual didn't really have a lot of room for emotion or intimacy. And in fact, when Spock was emotional or intimate, his human side was showing, and it was kind of his, his vulnerability, right? And so we grew up in a world where that wasn't really honored emotion. A lot of people would say, get, get control of yourself, or if you're going to go cry, go somewhere else, or Tom, you need to leave kindergarten. Um, <laughs> you know? And so it was something that wasn't really, it's not endemic to us uh, if we grew, grew up in the 60s and the 70s, right? And another thing in the professional world, I've kind of, I, I've always bridled at the idea that, show me the data. You know, who's here run into someone that just kind of, you know, show me the data, right? Because right? I feel like in some ways when you say that, you're stalling me. You don't want to really hear what I've got to say. You just want something, some sort of CYA, and you don't really want to know. And I feel like people who are focusing mostly on the data, with apologies to our, our m and guys, you know, measurement guys, but I feel like people who are tracking only the data are really missing an opportunity to, to find the nuance and find what's in there. And the other thing about you know, quantitative answers is that you're, you're kind of going into that with a sense of, I know what I want to find, and I'm going to pick it out of this pile of rusty junk. But you're kind of missing the explorative quality or the discovery, the sense of discovery when you get in. And so what I'm looking for is there a way to kind of get the feel. How can we feel you know, as we go? My great friend and a friend of the agency, Dave Gray, you may know him. Um, he's spoken here at Delight before. He's just finished a book called Liminal Thinking. And it's, it, it beautifully draws out, there's, a, there's kind of basically a stack of mentality that we have. There's the obvious that we all trade in. But just below the ground are beliefs and judgments and theories that we hold. And it's all basically linked to our experience. But they're not necessarily visible. You know, I might wear my emotion on my sleeve, but a lot of people aren't going to. And we kind of have to slow down and just take a minute to understand what's kind of under the ground, right? And the one thing I like about his book a lot is he talks about beliefs are models. Beliefs are ways we make sense of the world internally. Beliefs are created. So I might have a belief about something, but it came from somewhere. It came from my life experience. It came from what someone told me. Beliefs are tied to their identity. Myself and my beliefs are tied up. We all can imagine how that works nowadays. And then beliefs and experience are related on a continuum. And I think this, is, this has formed a lot of my thinking in terms of the research that I've been doing. I probably neglected to mention at the beginning that I've been kind of working on a new, not a new, but a research process that drives a lot of insight for Connective DX. So I want to talk a little bit about my favorite client. My friends here, hi guys, 
from everyone who's joined us. When I first heard about this, I heard, and this challenged my beliefs, I heard that there was, uh, there was a, a, a banking client in the Midwest that tied faith and finances together. They were in Indiana. And my little strategist mind was like, what? Wait a minute, Indiana? And then I heard these guys are Mennonites. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Aren't Mennonites the dudes that, that don't use electricity and they don't, how is that gonna work? They don't even have cell phones. This is ridiculous. I, of course, learned that I was completely wrong. But um, Everence started off as, uh, Mennonite, uh, as uh, Mennonite Mutual Aid. Uh, and, and it was an organization that was designed to help people uh, along in the community. And our, our, uh, my challenge was to get to know them a little better and obviously drive some insight into uh, a large experience design project that we're working on. Goshen is the town exactly you expect it to be, right? Uh, this is the Olympia Kitchen where they, they serve green olive and cashew sandwiches. This is the only daylight or only light you will find on the very cold mornings in February. It's four degrees and you're driving through town and the only light on the snowbank is from the Olympia Kitchen. It's a terrific place. <laughs> you know, it's, it's everything you think a small town is. Uh, there, are, there are four banks on one corner, and Babyface Nelson apparently used to go through there and rob banks all the time, you know? And I came to believe, I came to learn really fast that this is an enormously reasonable town, and it kind of looks like any other town in America that you might encounter except for that. Because there are, people act, there are people who are practicing their religion, and they're practicing their faith as, as Mennonites uh, there. And there's a whole range of people um, there that are, are, are bonded together in a community. So Everence is an organization that has, uh, they, they practice what's called biblical stewardship. Now regardless of your, your stand on faith, I'm an atheist, but I find uh, that the principles that they put forth are eminently practical and amazing especially when you're, we, you grew up in a world where the world is changing. Nandini talked about the pressures on young people nowadays, what's going on. I have kids that are that age, and that cold kind of sense of fear about your financial future or being okay in the world, there's some really interesting things going on here that help us begin to make sense of this. Live responsibly, prepare for the future, discover and plan for God's purpose, and give generously. Who would object to that? Some other ideas here. I'm kind of paraphrasing, so I hope you guys will forgive me. But share abundance with others, invest socially responsibly, lots of hands, many hands make light work, and community gives us power, right? We can be together. So for an experienced strategist to encounter principles like this to work with, I was thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled. Some of the things as I started digging into it, biblical stewardship asks us to do something more than just give money. Giving money can be a little cold. You know, homeless guy, help me out. Okay, fine, you know. What if you sat there for a minute and just sat there with them, right? Biblical stewardship asks us to do more. It asks us to provide or create a sense of intimacy with somebody else. Share your time and your abilities. Expand your relationships through helping others and being a good neighbor. So our business challenge was to take these ideas from two geolocations in the country and find a way to express this to a larger national audience because there's tremendous opportunity here, but also I think there's a tremendous um, I don't know, it's fascinating to me to think about bringing ideas like this to a national audience who I think could use it. So the methodology is, is, is pretty simple. I use journey mapping as a research tool. Um, I do interviews with people. We set up uh, phone interviews with, um, I guess, 30 to, 30 to 40 uh, individuals on the phone, okay? And I go into this without a script. And I'm happy to talk to anyone offline about the details of this, but I basically go in and I share a space there's a tool called boardthing.com, if you guys are, want to look it up. It's a tremendous tool. It's a way where you can share a screen individually with anybody else, and they see what you're doing. And so I'm basically creating the child bath. Both of our feet are in there together, and I'm interviewing someone, and I'm reacting. And both of us can, can modify this as we go. The next thing I do is I, I code. We do coding. I get transcripts for everything. And then as we do coding, what I'm doing is I'm reading through the transcripts, and I'm essentially meta-tagging uh, what we're seeing. So if something looks like uh, someone's talking about their children, they're talking about their family benefits, someone is talking about their children, but there's a tinge of fear, I might put those two together. And what's going on there is it's allowing me to, uh, um, I'm not going into this with a canned idea about what I'm trying to find. I'm going in this with an idea that I, I just wanted to, the truth to be revealed to us. And we might have multiple team members do the coding because we get different perspectives. But basically, 
it starts to come together. And some interesting things happened. Remember, I talked to people from the ages of probably about 24 up to um, 75, and I found some interesting things. Young people really feel lost. There's a sense of not measuring up. There's a sense of desolation for people. Young people were also telling me interesting things, like I, I don't know what factors are in it. I don't know what to do. Uh, there's, I don't feel like a grown-up. You know, when we were younger, we thought we'd have this figured out by now, but we don't. Something is making it harder. And I don't know where to start. Society grown-ups, you guys know this, right? I don't know what to do. I wish I, I could get some advice. And then there are also a number of young people that have worked really hard to invest in themselves, and they're saying things like, I am qualified, but I cannot afford my dream. I can't move forward. You know, is your dream worth a crippling loan payment? These people are dealing with that. It's not all bad. We found some fun things when I talked to some people. Now, just because of the, the Mennonite and Anabaptist culture can be kind of austere, a lot of men that were in their 70s told me the very first thing they did with their first money was to buy a car with white walls. That's what they wanted. White walls was a marker of beauty in a world of plainness. Also, they talk about money the way they talk about sex. This is a quote. They talk about money the way they talk about sex. Save it for someone you love. Money was a taboo topic. Then I met Kendall and Wilmer. They're in their 70s. They're missionaries. They've done this for a long time. Uh, and they're living stewardship well. They have an extended family. They have grandkids. And they, they're used to caring for their families and giving of time. So, and they already understand that once we have enough, it's our role and our job to give it to others. For them, generosity isn't only money. Generosity is time and, and commitment to their community. They're very skilled at this. And they have a cycle of giving already involved in their family. There begins to be a cycle of parents to children, to grandparents, to adults, this cycle, right? And it's, this is embedded in their faith. And they're doing it very well. These are successful people who have sold a business and who have moved on. Something happened, though, during the interview. I'd been talking to them for about an hour and 15 minutes. It was going long. I turned off the recording. I thought, we're kind of done. Ken and, Kenlin and Wilmer didn't stop. They kept going, kept talking to me. And they started asking me questions. How are you doing, Tom? What's going on with you? How's your life? I started talking about my kids, what's going on with them. And you know, my kids are in their 30s. They feel lost. They're not sure what's going on. And I, I felt this subtle shift happen during the interview at that time. And they started caring more about me than, than anyone else. I felt like the most important person in the room. And it was a little like I was folding laundry, and I felt them just there with me doing it. Like we were all in this together. And it just came clear as a bell to me what we needed to do for our experience strategy. If we could connect the young people who are feeling lost and need some help with the kind, reassuring um, skill and capability of Kenlin and Wilmer, we would have our experience strategy perfectly sewn up. It would be exactly what people need by connecting the two. Now, the long text of this I'm not going to go into too much. But I think you'll find, if you just kind of skim through, that there's some principles here that we really love. The idea is that money and possessions are not ours. We are merely stewards while we are here. And it's our job to take care of it and leave it better than we found it. OK? And as persons of God's, dependent on God's providence, don't be anxious about the necessities of life. It's OK. With skills, we got this. So the experience strategy we developed were three personas. Uh, Maria is a young person who needs guidance. Maria needs to see her path. Dennis is someone in midlife who needs some some uh, focus and a way to kind of build on the legacy is starting to get together. Glenn is someone who's in later in life, who's retired looking back. And his responsibility now is to give back. He's looking for a sense of harmony because it's his, his mode of stewardship is to kind of give time and his money. And so by connecting these three experientially, but to create focus, confidence, and harmony, we were able to design an experience strategy that met the needs. And it, it just sang. It's, Beautiful, I believe. So we talk a lot about it. Um, researchers are supposed to be dispassionate, stay out, be cool. I fill in head first. And I believe the benefits paid off, because I intu intimately feel this. And I'm choking up right now talking about it with you guys, because I believe that we were able to create a really interesting experience with a principle or a set of principles that are really quite profound and something that everyone in the world, I think, could pro probably um, profit from. So yeah, I fell in head first. So some things to think about when you're doing journey mapping and research. Ask for insight. Ask. Ask questions. 
you know, if I have a chance to speak with you, you probably find me asking a lot of questions. I love doing it. Reflect and be present. Be here. Maybe it's quiet. Maybe I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to listen. Don't go into this with a script. You become one of the data guys. I want to find this thing. But you've missed everything else, right? Hold on loosely. This one, you know, allow an intuitive frame. I would have not gotten the insight from Kenlin and Wilmer if I said, well, hour's up, we're done. It sounded like something was going to happen. We kept going. Other conversations I had, people just kind of took it in a direction, and that's when they told, us, told me about the white walls. You know, someone is going to give it to you in a structure that they want. Allow it to work. And the big one is be transformed. My life was improved by talking about biblical stewardship. I feel like it's better for me, and I think we created a great product for people as a result. I hope you find power in this. Thank you.